Okay. Thank you very much, David. And um, I would like to uh, thank the organizers of this seminar for the platform um, and for you to be my host today and actually for the support in my studies so far. I'm so grateful. Um, from the time I met you uh, at Ames Ghana, till now it has been, I mean, a, a fruitful journey. And right before I came to Germany for my PhD, the support you rendered to me, I'm so grateful. Thank you very much. So, and I'm happy that uh, I'm being hosted by you. <laughs> so, um, okay. So today I'll be talking about uh, the tropical symplectic Grassmannian. And uh, so in the outline, we will view some uh, two classes of Grassmannians. Um, so these ones are algebraic uh, varieties. So we have some structure of um, an algebraic variety. And then what I want to do with them is to look at um, a combinatorial version of them. So uh, instead of looking at um, algebraic objects, I mean geometric objects in the usual sense of algebraic geometry, I want to look at uh, combinatorial versions of them via a machinery called tropicalization, which we are going to see in a moment. And um, so in particular, we'll tropicalize the Grassmannians. And then the main theorem will be around seeing some differences which arise when we change from the usual situation to a new setting, which we're going to see, like it appears in the title. So we are going to have uh, to extend the usual setting so to the to setting. Okay, so let's write right away from the usual Grassmannian. So when one talks about the Grassmannian, um, this one is to be thought about as um, a set parameterizing all um, k-dimensional uh, linear subspaces of a vector space. So you fix a vector space of a field k. Of course, this can be identified with uh, um, k to n by choosing a basis. And then you take all k-dimensional linear subspaces. And then this set is called the Westmanian, as simple as that. And then, but more than that, it is actually a projective variety. It is an algebraic variety. And um, so maybe before going on, so um, the Westmanian is a generalization of the usual projective space. Because in the projective space, this one can be looked at as the points are the lines. So instead of the lines, we can talk about k-dimensional, arbitrary k-dimensional linear subspaces. So this is just a generalization of the usual, uh, the usual projective space. Now, this one can be given a structure of a projective variety because as I said, of course, we cannot do much with it. Now, the map which gives you this structure is called the broken bedding. But I will skip the details, but what it does, so when you have uh, an element in the Grossmanian, you can identify this with a vector in a projective space via um, identifying your linear subspace or your element with um, a matrix that represents um, that uh, linear subspace. And then, um, mapping uh, that matrix to minors or de determinants of sub matrices. So um, say you have a two by, well, three by three matrix representing L, then you take minors, maybe two, two by two minors, and then this will be your coordinates. So this is all we are doing. You just have a matrix representing L, then you take, um, or minus, you can order them in whichever you want. And then this one can be identified with um, a point living in this projective space and it chooses K because there are such many, uh, I mean, ways of choosing K by K minus from um, a K by N matrix here. 
And then we subtract one because we're in the predictive space, we require one degree of freedom. I mean, because of uh, the scaling. Okay. So, uh, yeah, like I said before, the precar coordinates are the minus of the K by N matrix whose rows span the subspace L in KN. Yeah. So, with respect to this embedding, the Grassmannian is a projective variety of dimension K into N minus K that satisfies some equations which are so expressed in a way. Um, not to say much here, they are quadratic. So they describe, um, so they give us that condition. So I see a question in the chat. Okay. Um, yeah, they give us the condition. Um, uh, um, okay, so uh, this is what they are. You take um, two subsets, one of uh, length k minus one from one to n, the other one of length k plus one from one to n, and you want to take the sum of all these products where you are just exchanging from the first set. Uh, from T, you remove an element I, and then you add it to S. And then, of course, we can always order these ones to make them increasing. And that's, that's catered for by the sign, which is written sign of I T minus S here. So we do this for all I. We're going to see an example soon. Um, so uh, these ones give you the condition for this variety to be cut out of this projective space. Yeah? So they cut out of this variety from the projective space we have seen above. We will not be ideal. So you don't have to, say, to think much about this at this moment. All you have to remember, we have equations which um, cut out our variety from the, uh, the projective space. And we live in this polynomial ring whereby we have um, these variables are all the minors we have seen above, yeah? For all possible uh, K sequences, J. So, um, so we have our ideal, let's call it uh, PKN. It will be the main player because when we are tropicalizing, um, we need to work with polynomials, classical polynomials, and we make them into uh, okay, we modify them so that in the end, instead of them describing a usual algebraic variety in the usual sense, it will they will describe a different kind of object, which is going to be in the tropical world. So we begin from something classical, in the classical way, the classical polynomials, then we transform or we deform them into um, a new kind of polynomials, like we're going to see very soon. Yeah, so these are our polynomials we'll be working with. And then for today, um, um, okay, so before I say what I wanted to say, we can also recap when, when we have, um, when, we, when we are given, um, a Pulka vector or a vector in the projective space we have seen, we can recover the corresponding linear subspace by um, this manner. So all we need to do is to take all points in K to the N, such that when we multiply the uh, Pulka coordinate T without I and uh, a point, I mean, an index xi, uh, and we sum over all i in, in this set t, this one, and uh, I mean, and this goes to zero, then uh, we have our corresponding um, linear subspace in that sense. So I give you a Bruca vector or a vector in the projective space, and it was k minus one, then you can give me the linear subspace 
to which it corresponds. Because like we said before, we are identifying um, linear subspaces with vectors in this polycrim space. So we can go forth and backwards, yeah? Okay, now I want to talk about um, the new or the second kind of variety. So one of them, I mean the first one in the Guasmanian, the second one is uh, the symplectic Guasmanian. So for this one, uh, we will need a vector space of um, even dimension because we want to talk about uh, a symplectic form. So uh, such a vector space is said to be symplectic if it admits a bilinear form um, that satisfies two conditions, one of them alternating, that is to say, uh, this form vanishes identically on V, uh, I mean, when you compute V and V on this form, this vanishes if and on, I mean, this vanishes whenever you are having the similar index, uh, indices. And then um, you have uh, the uh, symplectic form on U and V to be equal to zero for every U, only if um, V is equal to zero. And this is saying that it is non-degenerate. Yeah, so you want it to be alternating and non-degenerate. And um, the first condition implies that um, you have, like when you take two vectors, U and V, and then you exchange and you compute on the same form, V, U, uh, the sign changes. And um, this one is equivalent to the first condition, but uh, it doesn't hold when the char characteristic of the field is different from two. So this is why, like we're going to see later on, even when we go to the tropicalization, things will tend to depend more on the field and the characteristic of the field. Yeah, first of all, because of this. So this is one of the reasons, but even more to that we will see. Okay, so we have a notion of orthogonality yeah, when you have a bilinear form, so two vectors, U and V are said to be orthogonal if um, when you compute the corresponding symplectic form, the, yeah, this will go to zero. And then a subspace um, in K to 2N is called isotropic if every two vectors um, in L are orthogonal. So here I've written K to 2N, and I forgot to say that this is after identifying our, sub, uh, our vector space W with K to 2N by fixing a basis. So yeah, yeah I'm writing this because um, in my mind, I have already fixed a basis. So we can, make, we can have this identification, yeah? Okay. Uh, so um, what is the symplectic Grassmannian? So like the Grassmannian, the symplectic Grassmannian is um, also a projective variety, and uh, it is a sub variety of the usual Grassmannian um, parameterizing k dimensional linear, linear subspaces. I mean, so the extra condition we require, we don't need to take all the linear subspaces like before, but we take only the isotropic linear subspaces, i.e. the ones which um, correspond to orthogonal vectors with respect to our symplectic form. So this is, um, um, by all means, a subset, a subset of the usual Grassmannian, and even more, it is a sub-variety. And um, so we have also polynomials which cut out this uh, variety from 
the corresponding projective space like we have for the Grassmannian. And it turns out from the work of De Contini from 79, but this ideal, when, when you consider the symplectic Grassmannian as a subvariety of the usual Grassmannian under the brick embedding, the, the previous embedding we saw. So when you consider this same embedding, then the defining ideal or the polynomials which define this variety, uh, which cut out this variety, are uh, the usual uh, pre relations we have seen before, the quadratic ones, plus some extra relations, which we call symplectic relations. And these ones are linear. So um, what they do, they give you the condition for a subspace to be isotropic. So what you had before was just for a subspace to lie, to lie in the Grassmannian, was um, the relations we had before. And now we want to say that instead of having only arbitrary um, subspaces, we want them to be isotropic. So we need extra relations to ensure that we have only isotropic um, linear subspaces. So um, this is just giving you that condition. So we take the sum of all uh, Rika coordinates, which are coming from this sum. So for a subset of length k minus two from one to n, one to two n, and of course, um, there is some uh, nomenclature we will adapt here. So we will um, we will say uh, for an index i, i bar will be um, uh, just an evolution of i on i. So when you take i bar twice, you go back to i. So you could think about it as, um, for example, 2n plus 1 minus i. So when you do it twice, you go back. And this is just to give us, to split our set 1 to 2n in two, two parts because of our symplectic form. And it will be useful later. And also in our definition of the equations. So um, what, you, what we do for such a set S, you take um, a Pluka coordinate corresponding to S to this indexing set S with the union of I and I bar, I and this involutive element here. Yeah? And of course we can reorder this, we can reorder them. And because the Pluka coordinates are the determinants, whenever you reorder the sign changes and uh, the final sign on each term will be the final sign after reordering and putting in increasing increasing order. So um, those are our um, linear equations. And this, like I said before, in addition to the pre relations we have seen for the Grassmannian, they cut out the symplectic Grassmannian from uh, the corresponding projective space. So we have two varieties. And for each one of them, we have explicit set of relations describing their defining ideals. And um, so for the case k equal to two, so when k is equal to two, the corresponding ideal is easy to describe. It contains only um, three term critical relations. So if we fix natural numbers, um, I, J, K, L in increasing order. Remember our new nomenclature for one to two N. So we have one to N and then one bar to N bar. So we, we can match from N plus one to, to two N, we can replace this by one bar to two bar. So I have a question in the chat. Okay, so I have a question from 
in Zaganya is this simplex Grassmannian a definition or a construction? Yeah, thank you for the question. So the definition is the first point. So the first point is the definition, yeah? So the set of all these k-dimensional isotropic linear subspaces. Then what follows from there is a construction. Yeah, it's a, a very good question because we can have actually different construction and we would, uh, we would have different polynomials describing this. But in our work, we consider this construction. So by looking at the simplex Grassmannian as a sub variety of the Grassmannian, but one could also look at it on its own in a different embedding. Yeah, so thank you very much for the question. But does it answer your question? I mean, what I'm saying. Yeah, I hope. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, um, for k equal to two, the ideal, the defining ideal, is, um, is generated by three term recalculations, which are easy to describe. Um, so we fix these natural numbers in our new nomenclature for, for one to two n and increasing order i, j, k, l. And so we take these products of Rika corners, x, i, j, x, k, l, minus x, um, i, k, x uh, times x, j, l, and then x, l, and then times x, j, k, and so we want this to vanish. And then we have only a single linear relation in this case, that is x one one bar. Yeah, so from, from, from the uh, description, if k is equal to two, we only have one way of obtaining a relation from here and it will, it will only give us this one here. So x one one bar plus until x n n bar. So this is the complete set for k equal to two. And um, okay, I just wanted to give it as an example. And later on, we're going to see something corresponding to this linear relation. Um, because work has been done for, um, by Stumfels for the case when you have only these quadratic relations for k equal to two, and he gave a nice description so, um, but something gets twisted when you have this linear relation in addition. So later on, uh, we will see it again. Yes, so I have a question from Dr. Isaac Ousu. Yes, um, yes, I'm making this assumption but uh, n bar is greater than n, yes. So the way they appear here, one to n, and then one bar to n bar by an increasing order. Sorry, I didn't say that, yes. Okay. So um, from what we have seen, we have uh, five, equivalent ways of saying that a linear subspace lies in the symplectic Grassmannian. First of all, all polynomials in the ideal SK to N vanish on the precar corners of the linear subspace L. And then the second um, condition, equivalent way of saying that is that the precar coordinates of our linear subspace L satisfy the symplectic relations. Okay, thank you. Um, so for every pair U, V in L, we have that the symplectic form vanishes. That's the second way of saying. So this, this was from the definition here. Yeah? We say that um, for something to be isotropic, every pair of vectors should be orthogonal. And 
So basically, the third way of saying that a linear subspace lies in the symplectic Grassmannian. And the fourth way is saying that there is a basis of L, U1 to UK, such that every um, pair of this basis. So here, we are fixing a basis. Number three, we, we take arbitrary vectors in L, but now for number four, we fix a basis and you want only, only the pairs from this basis to, to vanish. That's number four. But number five, if L is Rossbahn Ros of a matrix uh, AB, so, um, so AB uh, from, uh, I mean the matrices over the complex numbers of size K by N, so here I already changed to C, um, but of course this works for arbitrary fields for K also. Then, um, so we want that if L is the row span of a matrix AB, then this product A times B transpose should be symmetric. So these five ways are equivalent in the classical case for a subspace to be isotropic. These ones are equivalent. I mean, um, one can check the last one. I think it is the one which needs checking, but I will skip it for this talk. Um, so, um, so we have five equivalent ways. Later on, we're going to see that we can, for each point, we can talk about the corresponding tropicalization. Now, um, uh, there's someone who usually says, Stufels <laughs> usually says that uh, anything can tropicalize. So you can tropicalize anything. It is just a process of moving from the classical setting to a new setting. So it is possible to tropicalize each of these sets one to five, and it will turn out that um, these different objects corresponding to these different um, I mean to these equivalent descriptions of an isotropic linear subspace, they will turn out not to be equivalent when you tropicalize. And um, okay, so we will see that soon. Now let's describe how to make things weird or beautiful. We are in sometimes like in the symplectic world things become weird, but in general, of course, tropical geometry is beautiful because it takes you from somehow complicated world of algebraic geometry to simple objects, combinatorial objects. And then along the way, you preserve some properties. And um, maybe before I go into some few details, some uses of tropical geometry, uh, it has been used to prove some hard theorems in algebraic geometry. For example, um, it has been used to prove um, irreducibility of some, some uh, complicated varieties and um, to prove other theorems. And also many theorems from algebraic geometry have and uh, have a tropical interpretation. So many things which hold in algebraic geometry have been proved. They have a, a, a tropical counterpart. And uh, it turns out some things hold true. I mean, in the usual sense um, of algebraic geometry, like dimension is somehow preserved and other things other invariants. Um, so the process is fruitful, so to say. And other applications in the other applications in financial mathematics. Um, also scarce um, resources management. And there are tools associated with this, like um, Bayesian distributions, Monte Carlo, stuff like that. So um, at the moment, it has developed, um, and there are quite many applications, different fields of mathematics. 
So, um, okay. Now the idea is to deform the classical field into something which is no longer a field, but a semi-ring. And for this talk, we'll consider the uh, tropical semi-ring, which is uh, the usual real numbers together with uh, infinity and um, two operations. One is the tropical multiplication, and that will be the usual multiplication, the classical multiplication. So when I take two numbers from my field, our union with infinity, positive infinity, this will give me uh, the multiplication of x and y will be uh, x plus y in the usual sense. So the plus here is the usual addition, yeah? And then the plus in a circle, this will be um, the minimum. So it's kind of pressure taking minimums. Now this is a conversion. There's another conversion where you can choose taking maximum. And then in, instead of taking uh, plus infinity, you will take minus infinity. Now, infinity and zero are um, neutral elements. The infinity is a neutral element for the uh, tropical addition, which is taking minimums. And the zero is uh, the neutral element for um, tropical multiplication, which is uh, taking sums in the usual sense. Okay, now we have a way of moving from the classical world to the tropical setting. There is a function which does this, which deforms the usual field into something which, um, uh, which looks like the definition where we are taking minimums and um, uh, we don't have the usual multiplication, but we take the addition as the multiplication. Okay, so this function is called variation. So evaluation on K is a function uh, to the tropical numbers, such like that for every two elements in our field, uh, evaluation of A is infinity if and only if A is equal to zero, and variation of two numbers A times B um, I mean the product of two numbers a, uh, a b will be the sum of the variations of a and b and then the variation of a plus b will be greater or equal to the minimum of the variation of the two numbers. Now I'll give um, a quick example. So if we take the field of rational functions, for example, this rational function, we can expand this as in um, a series expansion. And then we take um, uh, the exponent, I mean the smallest exponent, and then we take this as the variation. So we have a series expansion, and then we take um, the smallest exponent, and we call this the valuation. Now one can check that this satisfies uh, these three conditions. Okay, so this function does all the work of moving you from the, uh, from the classical setting to the tropical setting where from um, the classical objects to tropical objects, which are no longer curves like we know them and lines in the usual sense, but lines and curves in a new sense, which we're seeing soon. Okay. So um, now let, let's see how to use that function, the variation function to move from the classical setting to the tropical setting. So if I give you a polynomial, um, so here CU are the coefficients of your polynomial and x, u, these ones are the variables, the monomials. So yeah, x, u, this is x1, u1 times until x, n, u, n, yeah? So you have the sum of these monomials and their corresponding coefficients. So um, if you give me such, or if I give you such a polynomial, 
you can turn it into something which uh, corresponds to the setting we have seen before on the previous slide. And um, so what we do, we take the minimum um, of, uh, of this thing in the bracket. So we take the variations of all the coefficients from our polynomial. And for each coefficient, we add the usual dot product of the point we want and uh, the exponent. Yeah, so we map a point or a vector from Rn uh, to this function here. Now, one can check this is a piecewise linear function. So you see, instead of having the classical polynomial, we have something piecewise linear. So an example, if we take this polynomial, fx, um, given by x plus ty plus t cubed um, in this uh, polynomial ring um, in two variables x, y, over uh, our favorite field you have seen before. I use this field because we have seen an example of evaluation on this. Uh, so this is a field of rational functions. Um, so the tropicalization will be the coefficient of x is one and the variation will be zero from our example we have seen because um, yeah, one has, uh, I mean, one can be understood as t power zero. So the variation will be zero. And then, uh, so that's why we have only x here. And then for the second term, we also tropicalize the coefficient is t. Now, these t, t cubed are coefficients from our base field. So the variation of t is uh, one. That's why we have a one here. And then we add this with um, uh, the dot product of our, now I'm using the, I'm using abuse of notation. I would have chosen to write something else like W1, W2, but um, yeah, okay. I should have written W1 here and W2 because uh, these ones are points from Rn but it doesn't matter. So we have one plus uh, W2, and then we have W1, one plus W2, and then we have three for the last term. So uh, this can be written in the tropical notation. This would be X, tropical addition, one times Y, and then tropical addition, three. Um, okay, and so in so doing, I've also given an example of a tropical polynomial. I would like to pause a moment. Any question at this point? Okay, so um, yeah, this is the way of moving from the classical setting to the tropical setting. Um, is it clear? Yes, it is. It's, uh, I'm not seeing an expression. I think we can proceed. Okay. Yeah. Mm, thank you. And so, um, okay. Now, why do we want to localize our polynomials? We want to. Uh, describe some kind of varieties, which will not be the classical variety that I can, uh, have said before. And here, when you are given such a polynomial, you want to take all points such that the minimum is achieved at least twice. So when you do that, you get a picture on um, the right hand side. 
So uh, here the minimum is achieved at least twice. Now, uh, in the usual setting, for example, if you take T to be one, if you take T to be one, this would have been um, a line in the usual setting, yeah? But um, this is how uh, that line would look like. So these ones are the tropical lines. And people who do graph theory, you might already have a feeling of what this looks like, something like a tree for people who do graph theory. So you see, we're moving from the usual classical objects to things which are combinatorial, trees, um, graphs, in the usual sense. Okay. Uh, now, very quickly, I will just say what uh, the tropical, uh, the tropicalization of a variety is. So, so far I have told you what to do when you have only one polynomial. So when you have an ideal describing your variety, you can tropicalize um, your variety via this ideal by taking all the tropical hypersurfaces. So this is um, very important. You don't do it only for generators. You have to do it for all the polynomials, which are in the ideal, meaning the sums, products, and all of them. And so it is something hectic to do. But, um, OK, before I say that, so you, you take all the tropical hypersurfaces and then you intersect all of them for all possible polynomials in the ideal, not just for the generators. Um, so there is a theorem called fundamental theorem of uh, tropical geometry, which says that um, uh, when you do this, this is, equip, this is equivalent to taking points in your variety and taking their variations. So you take a point in your variety, you take the, the variation of the coordinates of that point, and you take the closure in the usual way. These two are equivalent, and that's uh, what they call the fundamental theorem of tropical geometry. So you can first tropicalize and take the tropical zeros, or you can first um, take you can take the points in the variety, and then uh, tropicalize. All of these ones are equivalent. Now, um, like I said, you have to consider all generators, all, all all polynomials. Now, when you take only generators of your ideal, what you have is usually not um, a tropical variety. It will not satisfy some of the conditions which are required. Um, one time, Diane was giving a talk and one condition she mentioned was something called balancing condition. So we want these things we get to be balanced in some sense. Now, when you take only finitely many polynomials, not all of them in the ideal, this might not be balanced. And this is what we call um, uh, a tropical variety when you take only finitely many, only generators. But sometimes they do coincide. The intersection of all of these tropical hypersurfaces and uh, the intersection of these uh, finitely many tropical hypersurfaces for the generators, sometimes they coincide. And if they do, then we say that we have a tropical basis. If they don't, then we call the thing on the right hand side a tropical pre variety, not a variety. Okay. So um, there is a nice theorem from Bieri and Groves. So it says that if your ideal, the one you're starting with, is prime and it has core dimension R, so this is the height of um, the supremum of the heights of all. Um, uh, ideals contained in that, chains of ideal contains in our ideal. So the core dimension of our ideal. Then the tropicalization will be a pure. So pure saying that, um, uh, okay. So the, a few things here, we just say what they are vaguely. So the polyhedral complex, these ones are intersections of uh, polyhedrons and these ones are given by some intersection of 
uh, things corresponding to inequalities in the usual uh, sense. And um, they have to intersect nicely. That's when we have something called polyhedral complex. And it's pure if all the maximal ones uh, are of the same dimension. So um, this tropical variety will be a pure polyhedral complex. For example, from what we have seen on the, a few slides ago, and it is a fun if we are in the constant coefficient case. So if the valuations will, um, will all be zero. So if the valuations are all zero, then it will be a fun, meaning instead of having arbitrary polyhedra, we will have polyhedral cones. So if you remember the matrix uh, description, for a polyhedral cone, we'll have, for example, a matrix A times a vector greater or equal to zero. And for a perhydron or perhydra, for perhydra, we will have an arbitrary vector, not zero. So uh, the fun is bit, of course, um, easier to work with than the general case when you have general perhydra. Anyway, so in the remaining few minutes, um, I will uh, say what the tropicalization of the Grassmannian is. So we have seen the ideal for the Grassmannian. So you take its tropicalization corresponding to this ideal in the, the, in the way I've described here. And then you, you do the same for uh, the symplectic Grassmannian, also for uh, its ideal, you can tropicalize. But these things have nice properties. I will skip the example. You can compute this in Macaulay too, using GFAN. You, you can just put in the ideal, and then you wait a, mi a bit and it gives you the information about um, this fan. Uh, uh, so the preferred is corresponding to these ideals are called durations. So we have seen what a preferred is. In the case, this is not a, a tropical basis. So those preferreds are called durations for the case of Grassmannians. And so for the usual Grassmannian, we call it Dresden, and we denote it by DR or KN. And then for the split Grassmannian, we call it SPDR, simple Grassmannian, K to N. And points in here are called uh, evaluated metroids. Points of the Dresden are called evaluated metroids. So Speyer and Stufa has proved that the precalculations form a tropical basis when uh, k is equal to two. So this means that um, the tropical uh, Grassmannian uh, coincides with it, the duration. It coincides with, with its preferiality. So we prove an analog in the symplectic setting, i.e. also when you take k equal to two, these two sets coincide. So you also have a tropical basis. So yeah, and but things change when you go to three, six, um, you don't have a tropical, a, a tropical basis for arbitrary characteristic, uh, but, but in the usual Grassmannian, you have a tropical basis actually. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I just want to talk about uh, this application um, to phylogenetic trees. So, just take a tree with any labeled leaves. This one has a, struct a structure. You can give it. You can give it a metric, and um, it is used to a space of such trees. Uh, is used to study things in evolutionary biology, and in arrangement of molecules like in DNA, and also statistical methods like maximum likelihood and Bayesian methods have been involved to study this space. Um, and it is interesting that it has a connection to the tropical Grassmannian. So if you remember very well, this looks like something we have seen before, an example of a tropical variety we have seen before, yeah? Only that now it has four, four nodes. Last time we had only three, yeah? So yeah, this one can be identified with the tropical Grassmannian. 
and McLagan, the Annie McLagan and Struffels did this identification. So you have something which is used in biology to study stuff, and then it is it has some geometry behind and understanding it using geometry enhances what people can do um, statistically, for example. We obtain a similar coincidence for the tropical se uh, setting, but with a disturbance. Remember the, um, the single linear relation I talked about? So when you take the corresponding hyperplane, this will be uh, a disturbance. In the, uh, you won't have only trees, but you will have the intersection of these trees and this hyperplane. So, but it is something you can consider it as a scaling of some sort. Okay, I won't say much about that again. So we have an application to evolutionary biology for the usual Grassmannian, and then we have a vague interpretation in the symbolic setting. Okay, then we can count the number of rays and the number of um, top dimensional cones in the tropical symplectic Grassmannian, because this has been done for um, the usual Grassmannian, and we have a description um, of the symplectic Grassmannian in terms of the usual Grassmannian. So combining results from Speyer's paper, Speyer and Stouffer's paper, we obtain also a count for those rays and maximum cones. And um, so I will skip a few things here. Now to, to the five points we saw before, we can associate to each one of them a, a tropical counterpart. And I will just skip this tropical counterparts because of time. I think I haven't been fast enough. So, but to each of those points, five points, we can associate a tropical counterpart. And uh, the theorem says that, um, okay, so let me just mention the tropical counterparts. So to point number one, now we want the point, the, uh, the point to lie in the tropical symplectic Grassmannian. Then point number two, we want the linear subspace to lie, the tropical linear subspace to lie in, in the symplectic version. Number three, we want it to be isotropic in the symplectic case, symplectic sense. And then something we call raw orthogonal presentation. We can talk about orthogonality in the tropical sense. So we have this notion. And then we have a map which takes you from a tropical matrix, a matrix with tropical entries to its minors. And this gives you something we call symmetric presentation. So these are five different ways of saying the same thing like in the classical case. But it turns out, unlike the classical case, when you come to a symplectic setting, things are no longer equivalent. And we have a full uh, characterization of these uh, equivalences. So, so one implies two and one uh, also implies a three in general. Um, this can be checked directly. And then for some kind of linear subspaces, um, so at some point I say that uh, points which lie in the duration are called uh, variated matrices. And then I have just said there is a map which takes a matrix to, to minus, and then things which come this way are called transversal. So things which come from point number five are called um, transversal. So when we're in this setting, three implies four, and then five implies also four. So I think things which come from uh, taking uh, determinants, but tropically. So instead of taking a determinant in the usual sense, you take it with tropical operations. And then when k is equal to one, all, all of them are equivalent. And then uh, when k is equal to two, we have, we have already seen this theorem by equivalent. This is the case when k is equal to two. That's the theorem which is analogous to Speyer and Stouffer's theorem. 
And when k is equal to n less or equal to three, then two is equivalent to, to three. Yes, so in the talk today, um, we have seen a way of moving from the classical world to, to the tropical world. So from the usual lines in, in uh, R2, for example, to um, tropical lines like we have seen. And these lines can be understood as trees, graphs from graph theory. And this can be interpreted in terms of the space used in evolutionary biology to study evolution of things. And then we have seen uh, different objects which arise in this setting, the duration, and how they relate to one another. And we see that in the symbolic setting, the main result is that um, things change a bit and um, what you would have thought would be equivalent. Uh, yeah, we would have thought everything would be equivalent to each other still, but this is not the case. And we also have um, a couple of uh, counter examples. Yeah, but uh, because of the time I wasn't able to include any. And I would like to stop here and thank you very much for your attention.